Hello, I'm Rachel Gilkey, Director of Programming and Education at Irish Arts Centre in New York. We are delighted to be joining Skeen Press today to help launch an absolutely wonderful collection of stories rooted in the storytelling tradition of the traveler community in Ireland, collected and told by Owen Divardoon with illustrations from Leanne McDonough. This collection is vivid and lyrical, personal and universal, and as many of us at ISC who have now read it can attest to, a transporting reading experience, something I think we can all appreciate in this moment in time. Today also officially launches Irish Arts Center's Fall 2020 Digital Season and our Fall at Home with Irish Arts Center series. Please do visit irishartcenter.org to find out more about our programming, which we're pleased to be able to offer for so much of it for free across all our disciplines with the goal of keeping us connected and inspired through this autumn. I'm delighted that Owen will be joining us again on November 1st to take part in our annual Iha Hauna Irish Halloween event for families. So that means you have between today and November 1st to order the book from Skeen Press. Links for both IAC's program and how to order the book will be in the comments. And please do submit any questions there as well for after the reading and conversation. I'd like to note that Skeen Press will ship internationally. I'm now pleased to introduce Grania O'Toole and Fanula Koch of Skeen Press, who are publishing very exciting Irish voices like Owen. Please also do check out This Hostel Life by Melatu Uche Okore when you visit their site. They'll tell you more about Owen and the author Deirdre Sullivan, who is in conversation with him today. We love that this difficult period of time has given us an opportunity to grow our community in new ways. Thank you for joining and enjoy the launch. Thanks, Rachel. Um, we're delighted to be launching Why the Moon Travels by Owen de Vardoon. We want to sincerely thank the Irish Arts Centre and NYC for partnering with us on this. Little did we think when planning a launch back in January that we'd be ultimately doing it online. And um, the upside of that, of course, is that a lot more people can join us in Ireland and abroad. Um, Owen de Vardoon is a creative soul with a passion for poetry, folk herbalism, and preserving the beauty of traveller tales, sayings, retellings, and historic exchanges. He's the manager of an education centre and a longtime board member of several Minkeri community groups. He seeks to pair community activism with cultural celebration, recalling old tales with fresh modern connections, and most of all, he wishes to rekindle the hearth fires of a shared kinship. He's an incredibly talented lyrical writer, as well as a wonderfully warm and generous person. Uh, for us in Skeen, the process has been an absolute pleasure from beginning to end. We've been privileged to sit with Owen around his kitchen table and witness absolute magic flow from him onto the page. Thanks, Manula. Yeah, we're absolutely delighted to be here this evening to launch the book um, with Owen and um, with uh, the wonderful Deirdre Sullivan. And I suppose the book is the first of its kind um, in Ireland. It's where, and Owen talks about it brilliantly in his introduction to the collection, where travellers um, you know, are curating their own stories, their own narratives. And the book, um, as Fanula and Rachel both said, um, you know, is illustrated beautifully by Leanne McDonough. So it's one of a kind. And I think that's what was a really important aspect for Skeen Press, because we are seeking out uh, themes and stories that are underrepresented in Irish literature. And we're very keen that people will see themselves in literature into the future and uh, more writers will come forward bringing different themes that we don't often get a chance uh, you know, to see and to read about in Ireland. So um, we're delighted about that. And um, it's fantastic to have Deirdre Sullivan here who herself is an award-winning writer and um, uh, her her last uh, publication, Tangoweed and Brine, was a, a massive success. And um, she will be her next book will be released on the first of October, Savage Her Reply, which is a retelling of the um, of Irish folklore as well. And um, she is also uniquely placed to talk about talk with Owen tonight, and um, because they're both are rooted in the um, folklore tradition as well. So we're absolutely delighted um, that she is here with us um, this evening as well. And uh, we look forward to the publication of her new book too. And um, so over to you, Deirdre and Owen, and who will be um, in conversation for the next while. Thank you very much.
a few words before um, Owen reads and then we have a chat. Um, Owen de Varadun is an educator, poet, folk herbalist and an avid archivist of traveller tales, sayings, retellings and historic exchanges. He manages an education centre, has had the honour of being vice chair of the Irish Traveller Movement, a council member of Mincare Widden and a board member of several local Mincare action groups. Why the Moon Travels is his debut and the voice it gifts the reader with is poetic, assured, frank and skillful. Sebastian Barry said of it that it is a truly important book which manages somehow to embody in the same breath the dazzling philosophy of the Pavi and the powerful poetry in their stories. Owen de Wardoon's lovely introductions are passionate and beautifully written in their own right, and his versions of these vivid stories are extraordinary and deeply affecting. The whole enterprise is both personal and universal and also marks the debut of a true writer. This collection of stories marry the natural world and the human one, and have something very important to say about the connection between the two. Connection is a key theme in Why the Moon Travels. The connection between child and parent, between teller and listener, between childhood and adulthood, and between a traveller and their culture. When we think of collection of folk tales that Grimm Brothers spring to mind, and perhaps Lady Gregory for Ireland, stories from the oral tradition of a culture are gathered and processed by, for consumption all too often by those outside it. And it is both rare and wonderful that this connection gives voice and value to the richness of story and that it is authored by a traveler as well as a poet, teacher, activist, and herbalist. The writer Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie speaks of the danger of one story. And I am sure that many among you are aware of how words used about travelers can be woven through with poison and the very real danger and impact of that. The stories in Why the Moon Travels, and I guarantee that more than one of them will lodge within your heart, are both balm and celebration. And I would be remiss not to mention the beautiful artwork by talented illustrator Leanne McDonough. Owen himself puts it far better than I could in the introduction to the titular story when he says, one of the reasons we tell this story is that it reminds us that travelers are part of the world and the world is part of travelers. When you don't see or hear yourself anywhere else, stories like this become important as an anchor to where and why you live. But what are they about? Covering a timeline that spans from pre-Christian Ireland with the tale of Mich the healer and his sister Ermit, to famine times and the tender heart of a hedgehog, to de Varadin's own childhood, where he shares how the stories found him and their resonance in the timeline of his own life. Plants and animals hold stories and cures, and even the stars above us are glittering fragments of an enormous fish eye. I loved this book, and it is an honour to have been asked to launch it. I wish Owen every success with my, Why the Moon Travels, and look forward to seeing what he does next, as I am now a huge fan. I'm now going to invite Owen to read um, ye a little bit from, um, from the book itself. So get ready. <laughs> And um, what we see there, hopefully here today, is I suppose an opportunity for us to continue a conversation. I think that it is largely overdue. Quite often we listen to each other in hopes of replying and rather than truly listening to each other. So here is a part of what I very much feel is a part of my own heart, shared in the most honest way I can share it. So the story I chose to, to first read would be Why the Moon Travels, um, which in Gammon is titled An Alumi Dutta Smushler. My father used to stand in the hallway, beneath the amber glow of the light, equally stepping between the bedroom my brother and I shared to that of my elder sister. With a cup of tea in hand and maybe a cigarette, he would recount the old stories and lull us off to a deep sleep. He was gifted these stories around campfires in his youth, from young and old alike, who filled the evenings with tales and the ever-growing retellings. For many travellers, it comes with a responsibility to retell it. For stories passed in. One of the reasons we tell these stories is that they remind us that travellers are part of the world, the part of travellers. Hear yourself anywhere else. Stories like this become important as an anchor to where and why we live. This is one of the traditional stories my father once told me at bedtime. It's shorter than most, and though somewhat bittersweet, always made me smile. 
In a time long ago, when the earth was young, and the moon was a set and sky, silent still. Sometimes, in whispered rumours, it was said that the moon would visit. When it did, it took the form of a beautiful lady. Charming and alluring, stern and strong, she was a light unto herself and was kind to those of the earth. She guided many at night with the light that she had borrowed from the day, making sure that none would ever lose their way as they travelled near or far from their home. It was told that once, during her time on earth, that she met and fell in love with him in care. He was of short stature, slender and wispy, without a single distinguishing physical feature that would stay in the minds of those that met him. However, the less, people's eyes fell in warmth at him. While he was sun or star, he had a secret somewhat glow expressed in unspoken words and graceful motions. One night, on his way back from town, where he had spent the day sleeping, he decided to cut through a field to get home more quickly. Although his steps were hurried, he found by the moon. She had been sensing that there was a between them. She just slowly changing from a sphere of light to the glowing outline of a figure. He walked and turned to flee, but she started to sing a low melody with words that he didn't quite understand, but sensed them to be kind or welcoming. He turned back to her and saw her for who she was, not just the moon, but in fact, a beautiful one. She was lovely and fair, a skin like fallen snowflakes and hair like the softest of silk. Light mixed with grey, like clouds passing through the twilight sky. Her eyes were pale blue, soft as a falling snow. She was draped in cloth of dark twilight blue with glints of speckled starlight and backlift in soft copper tones. Their love was wild, warm and daring enough to charm even stars from the heavens. She wore him to secrecy though, as mortal men were not made to have love affairs with those of eternity. And for many years she visited once a month and met with him in Kerry in the silence and wonder of the night. They would meet by a young river, the sound of the trickling water echoing the murmurs of their love. Days, months, years, but age chased him slowly, for time was halted by mortal men in the presence of eternity. By those around him succumbed to the batterings of age, the men came older at a far slower pace. He hurried through his day, eager for nightfall. He would champ out the shelter of tall trees and wait for a night without clouds, longing for the glimpse of his beloved. He would sleep with the canvas of his lobe and open, so he could gaze up at the sky or down at the moon's reflection in the river. In time, his want of her consumed him, and much of, of his joy was lost to it. The once charismatic Minkair grew boastful and full of pride. One night in a pub surrounded by friends, he told them of the beautiful lady of the moon, or was the moon that she had chosen him for a lover and companion. Of course, his friends did not believe him, so he decided that he would show them. The next time the moon came to the river, the Minkiri hid his friends behind a holly bush, allowing them to catch a glimpse of her. Now the moon, in her ageless wisdom and always knowing his eyes were upon her, understood that he had lied and she discovered his friends. She was so shocked and bereft by his betrayal that she returned away from her lover and from his mortal embrace. She went back to the sky and hid herself in the darkness of the great nothing. The heartbroken Minkair called to the sky, but the moon, she did not answer. She loved him and knew that he, despite the wrong, loved her. But for now that their passion was known, they could never be together. Since then, the moon is no longer settled upon the heavens, but crowd tentatively tonight and searches the earth for someone to love as much as they would love her. Each time she is disappointed and sorrowfully turns her face away. She returns to rest in the solitude of the great. The sharpness of her very own grief is again blurred and blunted by the deep well of strength that lies within her. And again, she gray gazes, hopefully, upon the earth. Since that night, and every night since, the moon herself travels the sky. And among other things, this story reminds me of the fragility of trust and the innate desire to love in all things and all people. Thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, so one of the things that I have been wondering about um, your book, uh, it's your debut collection. Um, and I'm just very interested in the story of how it came about.
drawers and presses and into the back of our rucksacks. And at one stage I had a blog that I kept and I'd heard about um, Sky and Press from people about how they had started to make waves into kind of, I suppose, the unexplored authors. So I sought them out. And one of the things that was very important to me is that I think that when writers meet someone who's going to publish, that it's not just a project, that it has to be a relationship. So um, I wrote to them, I sent them some, we met. Um, I wouldn't consider it an interrogation, but they certainly listened to me. Uh, I, until I puzzled out all these things and ideas and thoughts and concerns that I had had. And um, they, 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 they enjoyed the work, they enjoyed the, the vision of it. And thankfully they commissioned me. And the rest of the process was really about sitting down, listening to the stories. Like I got a dictaphone, I, I spoke them out, I let see the rested in me. If it's, I just moved and tried something else. And then you went to go to family and friends going, is this reflective of the story, the essence of a story? Because all stories that need to be retold, otherwise they become the story. And the story is such a, at times can be such a toxic thing because it locks something that's so beautiful and wants to blossom its own way into a set form. And that is such a fragile way to hold a story because it takes all the beauty and the colour from it and just makes it this kind of facade of what it could have really be, which is part of our own hearts in motion. And um, yeah. yeah, and like I'm blessed that I've had the experience of being the enslaved writer arguing over a sentence. I'll come back to that. When that wants me to hear it, I'll hear it. And um, I'm quite lucky to have um, the publishers that, that I have had and do have um, with giving me the freedom to, to listen to the stories and, and let them have, I suppose, their own life. One of the things that I um, I loved about your reading, actually, because I had, I had the book open and I was reading along <laughs> with your voice, um, is that like exactly like that, the nuances did, uh, like of the language altered slightly, just every word choice or whatever. And it really, um, it really drew me in and it reminded me of the oral tradition and that stories should be a living, breathing thing. Um, family and the deep and lasting impact that stories shared as an act of love can have in the life of a child is um, something that resonated very deeply with me as I read Why the Moon Travels. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how your relationship with these stories changed as you grew. Um, did you hear them differently at different points in your life? Oh, most certainly. Like one of the stories that until I came to, to inscribe me, although I had listened to it several times and heard people um, say it and recant it since I was a child, was the story of where spiders came from. And as a child, I thought it was just a, a origin story of where spiders came from. And when I was exploring it and talking to people and listening to it and listening to it just kind of mingle its way, its little crawly hands and kind of fingers around my mind, I realised that it is at the same time a story, origin story of spiders, but also that on explored and unhonoured work and labour of women and how they can be very much over overlooked and diminished and people can have aversion to it and people can kind of dismiss it quite easily and although it's highly crafted it comes with such care and as I kind of that was in itself that when I was listening to that story time and time again just in order to, to I suppose sieve out parts of it I realised that it is both the spiders and our relationship with women and the, how the community preserves that is a, a, a collective not just travellers and um, that really shifted for me. And the idea that stories are always allowed just to be stories. But if we listen enough, they come with such power. They can really open us up to both injustices, lesser known and heard voices, but also the day-to-day -day reality of ever hear or see. Like most people want the great voyage and the great drama. And sometimes the real poetry is found in day-to-day -day life and, th and those chimes and rhythms that we don't always pick up on. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, kind of in a way, it's very appropriate that we're all here in our homes um, as this collection launches um, near our hearts. <laughs> um, in the introduction, Owen, um, you speak of three aspects that characterise the stories of the Irish traveller community. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about the storytelling tradition that you grew up with? Mm -hmm. Um, storytelling was very innate as a part. Um, I was quite surprised uh, growing up, I suppose, to what I assume is maturity, um, that many other people didn't have that, that aspect within their lives. And I thought maybe the introduction of television or maybe the, the family's movement setting, 
but I think that it was a way of keeping to our, our heritage, maintaining the wisdom and voice that people come behind us. Because I do truly believe that when we do inherit a story, we do it does come with responsibility to pass it on. Because every story comes with a bias, an opinion, a joy, a loss, misconception, hope. And we, when we don't pass that on, we we silence voices of people behind us who may no longer be with us. So there is another way to make sure that our loved ones, the people that were a part of us, continue. Um, but also at the same time, the stories, regardless of how fantastical they are or how un unusual, absurd they are, they're always told with a sense of truth. So this is how actually what happened, but with the understanding that all things are always possible. All things are always possible. And naming the origin of a story, the putting into context and framing of where it met you is very important because hearing a ghost story beside a deep dark woods is going to be so very different than hearing a lost lover story beside a deep river. It really sets in a different tone and it shows the people who we're sharing the story with how that came to us and it honors the story and also honors how the story can change and grow over time. And those three aspects of the, the retelling, the origin of it, but it plays in context and the sense that it's always told as truthful, really hinges on the part of allowing people the freedom to retell their own stories. And I am from a family of storytellers. My father would be a very well-known storyteller within the community. He'd be a poet. Um, my grandmother was a storyteller. Um, and then you realize that most people are storytellers. They just tell stories in different ways. Some people tell stories through little words and, and gossip and rumors of other people. Other people tell stories through artwork. Other people tell stories through like their, the movement of their body or their gardens, how they sculpture something. And, um, and it's all about learning going, how do we actually listen to that and feel that and experience it in different ways? And for my own family and from the Irish travel perspective, a lot of it is auditory. And it's not just the idea of this story. It's really a way of preserving information and sharing it, uh, but also enjoyment and fun. And the idea that the world can sometimes be very heavy and these things can give us wings. Yeah, um, they absolutely can. And I really, I really love what you said about inheriting stories and passing them on um, and the kind of what what layers we discover as we grow and also what layers our own voices can add um and the decision to include the um the introductions that kind of honor say for example your father and your grandmother and their voices um to the stories was a powerful one and the combination of story and memory uh, added to the impact of um the stories within the collection was it always your intention to combine memoir with folklore in Why the Moon Travels? Um, no, I wouldn't. I thought originally it was kind of going, I'm just going to write the story. This is what the story is there. This is how I'm going to share them. And then when I was listening to them, it really became quite clear that you can't just pass on a story at times. Now, you, you can, and I, I, I've done it, but it doesn't always have the same flow with it. Part of the reason that there is some of my memoirs is that one of the challenges I find that comes up in life quite regularly is that people don't know anything about travellers. And as a traveller, with my own complexities and diversity and identity, to produce to a single factor that people don't know something about, rather than adding to a sense of mystery, does in fact lead us to greatly a sense of isolation. So adding stories that were authentic to myself was a way of saying, I want to be part of your conversation. Come, rather than just read, come and sit with me and let's share this experience. Um, like with all stories are parts of us. And I, I kept cropping in, like the idea would be, my original in introduction and framing of it was actually in an email to say, this is where the story came from. But they quite slowly navigated their way into the actual stories themselves in a very natural way. And, um, and then I just started to realize that they themselves are a part of that story, recognizing where they came from and also their effect on me, because they have had a profound effect on me. So there's and parts that I haven't even really got to understand yet. There's there's different ideas and, and points of, of my own mm -hmm. life that I use them as points of strength or points of release or to kind of just a, as determination and, and, and focus. And um and I think that's one of the things that we all discover, especially as, as, um, as a writer, is that the, the stories are very much and authentically a part of us and they're forever retelling their, themselves to us. We're always getting another version, another line, another oh, another perspective. And um, I just happen to be in this one and I was, I'm absolutely joyed to be. Um, that's, that's beautiful. Um, 
I, uh, it's clear from, um, from reading the story, and also from what you said there, that there is such a wealth of, um, of lore to be cherished and shared in traveller culture. Um, was it difficult to narrow down to the 20 stories within the collection? Yes, <laughs> to put it simply. Um, I, I think we all make assumptions about our own lives and, and where we are and our own experiences. There's, there's loads of factors that like the people within the wider traffic community, outside the wider kind of suppose, traffic community, had known about. I thought it was very ordinary for people to know why badgers have stripes, the origins of spiders, and the, the moon, why she moves in the sky. I had, I had assumed that these, these factors and the standings were known. Um, just like we have some stories of like the wren, by the, the king of birds, and the robin red chest, and kind of going. And I just found it fascinating about how the community had lost a lot of that connectivity. And I was kind of going, so when you're in the world and you're wandering around, is the world around you a strange place? And I was quite blessed with the understanding that everything had a history, everything had a reason, everything had a, a story, regardless of how old or new it was, that everything had a place around us. And when, and when things around us have places, we have places. So we and we were and um, yeah and, and I, I think that the, it, it it really it really showed myself a mirror to my own I suppose conceptions of only because I have been experienced or know something doesn't mean the wider community may have experienced it and um, but also comes as a as a real challenge uh, but to, to us all to actually start to reconnect with our own stories and something I I always like to ask people and never then no should ever be put under pressure to answer it but can you remember the first story that you were told and can you remember the first story you told because I think a lot of times that puts a lot of framework around ourselves and how we relate to people what we value in exchange and then the idea of like kind of going what like excites us and give us that warmth and fire and many people don't remember and I was kind of going well maybe go find out and if you don't remember find new ones like pick a story to be your new first story to tell you know and um, because I think it's part of the tradition and there's loads. And, and one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to, to progress on to uh, later is, is um, because I know, I know actually no one wants to go up, but it's coming out to me now. And um, the idea of kind of another book and, and, and I'm hoping to plant it around um, traditional ghost tales, uh, but also just ghost tales that are traditional, but also my own kind of what's coming out of my own imagination and ideas and thoughts. And there's, there's creatures and features and factors of our own tales we don't have. Part of it, I think, is because we were a nomadic community, uh, we moved around different areas and regions, different language aspects, that we picked up bits here and there and our own imaginations. So they are unique and they are different, and we're most certainly not short of stories. Well, however, we are very short of platforms to share them. And um, I think that the, the, what the book really is bringing is a step into that world that hopefully far more people um, will follow after me. Absolutely, and um, and what a wealth of stories you have shared. Um, and I really, I really liked what you said about kind of how they connect us to the world around us. Um, and I think that like when you have a story about the world that you do connect to deeply, like you will look at a badger differently, you will look at a hedgehog differently, you will feel the kind of the tenderness and the, the emotion that you felt reading and experiencing the story kind of as you navigate the world and that's such a gift to have given the reader Owen. Um, I was going to ask you about um, the use of gammon which added greatly to the stories. Um, apart from why the moon travels um, and uh, possibly the book Can't Lose Can't, um, a collaboration uh, between traveller children, um, settled children and an artist or Lacanian linguist Marion Brown um, which was supported by the Kildare Library Service. I can't really think of another place that I've encountered it written down. Um, can you speak about your relationship to Gammon and about how you decided what to include and how much? Um, I, I'd have a very personal connection with, with Gammon. Um, I think it's one of our beautiful inheritances, but also as a point of resistance. I think one way to really to reduce a community is to take the voice from them. And the more we use our language, the more we reconnect to who we are. Um, how they came out in the stories that it came out very naturally is that when I was recording them, I really wanted to just to, like to share them myself to, to, like, to a younger me again and not to be editing them for like a settled audience or people who wouldn't understand me. So there are nuances in it that who don't get some of the cultural factors 
won't pick up on. An example would have been a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a reading done by the wonderful actor, uh, Michael um, Collins, and he picked up stuff in the story um, that people from the wider community wouldn't have picked up and nuanced because it's not explained. But from a travel point of view and some of the kind of cultural aspects, he knew exactly what I was hinting at. And there was, so there's that kind of like a level kind of uh, uh, as a part of it. But being a part of the language and having it there, and allowing it to come through very naturally was very important to me. Same as the way of, because it's unscripted language, bringing it together within the community to say, it's a language, it's diverse, it's evolving, it's supposed to evolve, it's supposed to change, it's supposed to grow. But let's take a moment, not just to, ca not to capture it, but just to get a wisp of it and, and make sure that it's a part of the tale. And, um, and there's, 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 a, there's regional, I suppose, dialect that has been used, and that was with consultation with people. Um, but at the same time, it, it, I hope that it's open enough that, I, that people will understand it and may not always, as I read it, may not always understand it, but will able to still be able to pick up on some of the, the, the story. Because one of the things I really want to do is I didn't want to edit for an audience. I wanted to share something like that with people. And keeping that line and keeping that relaxed openness, I think, really helped me. Um, because these are Travers stories and I wanted to tell them as Travers would tell them. Like we would, we, rather than saying money, we often say grade, car, we say lark, you know, soothing for young boy. And rather than saying boy, you know, and stopping myself, kind of going, just let it flow and just, just let the story be the story. Because that's what I always wanted to be, it wanted to find its own voice. No, absolutely. And I think that, um, I think your instincts there were captured from, you know, to avoid, I suppose, taking taking something so important and so intrinsic to the stories out in order to make it palatable would have been like i just i think it adds so much um like as someone who felt that listening to and experiencing gammon within the stories was sort of the gift of an unheard voice or a voice that not many people outside the traveler community get to hear and I suppose for traveller readers, it's even more of a gift because they get to see themselves woven through, um, which, as you've said, those platforms are all too rare. Um, and to come back to voice, your own voice is poetic and there is a rhythm and a beauty to the imagery in Why the Moon Travels that sings to the reader. Um, as a poet, can you tell us a little bit about how your poetry informed your prose and of the challenges, if any, of moving from one medium to another? Um, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, I, I didn't really experience it as a challenge. I really sensed it as an invitation. Um, the idea of poetry is, is, is us sitting with ourselves to to, I suppose, to, to, to take a glimpse of what our heart wants to say and a way to share it. The writing of the book was similar to that. It was really about how the words would come out and there was times that I just said, I'd say it, I'd sit with Grainne and Fanula and they're going, going, what's the word for that? Or you're kind of going, no, it's not that word. It's coming to me, no. And we'd come back to it. It was the way that it, it formed itself. And, um, and I, yes. I think that stories like this are always reforming ourselves deeper in us and, and behind us. And they're just waiting for that opportunity and that chance to, to rise. Um, and I do believe that all people are poets. All people are absolute poets that don't even realize it. And again, like, it's just people create in different ways. And sometimes we hear them, sometimes we don't. And um, I, I think for myself, I just uh, having the opportunity to have that space and um, to have the permission to fail horrendously if I wanted to or happen to. And just to say, like, uh, one of the things I kept going back to myself going, it's like, it's just so Irish. It's like a cup of tea. It's just a cup of tea. Some people like dark tea. Some people like really milky tea. Some people like it sweet. Well, what kind of cup of tea do I want? Do you know? So I decided to go off and just kind of craft my own cup of tea. And this is the way it formed itself. And I think it formed itself in a very natural, very like without much pain or hardship in me because I just like the idea of just, just let it flow. And regardless of what seeds you plant, just trust that something beautiful is going to grow from it. I think regarding the book, that it's something I'm incredibly proud of. I do think all the things I've done, it is something that I most certainly find beautiful. Yeah, well, it it is beautiful, and I loved um, I love that cup of tea analogy because there is nothing like a good cup of tea, um, oh, and no. the, the comfort and um, the warmth in the stories um is kind of it evokes a similar a similar feeling and. 
with regards to kind of, I suppose, poetry and the fact that these stories come from the oral tradition, that is, you know, the similarities are there. I know, like, when I read a poetry collection that I deeply love, I feel the urge to read the poems aloud. And I experience that kind of similarly with Why the Moon Travels. They kind of ask, they ask to be voiced. Um, I was wondering to kind of segue um, into a different area. Um, the plant world is something that you care deeply about and many origin stories mm. and medicinal uses of plants are woven through um, Why the Moon Travels. And that was extremely interesting to me. Um, and I was wondering, um, as a storyteller and a gatherer of folklore and information, do you have a favourite bit of plant lore? Um, well, I, I, I do and I don't. I, I, ha I have probably would be my strongest memory. So there's a plant called bindweed. Most people will find it, often find it growing on tenders of walls, on fences, and especially the ones with the crossed wires. It's a, it's a broadleaf plant with a kind of a trumpet of a white flower. And when, when we were children, we were told that this is how the Grewogs, the fairies, would talk to each other, almost like telephones. They would whisper into them and it would carry through the thread of the, of the, the vine to another area. And it absolutely captivated my imagination. And when we were quite young, there was many that would encroach on the grounds of my mother's garden. She was incredibly protective of her garden. But she'd always had a few of the flowers, um, like blossom through the children and whisper secrets to the Grewogs. That is something that's always captured my heart. But if we if we start hearing us the, um, the the tales around us, there's so much information that we uh, at times are so disconnected from, and um like and like, and I try to imbue it very naturally in some of the tales, like the tales of the um, grand of the the hedgehog, and the story of some of the foods that he brought to some of the Minkir kind of families. Um, some of those foods are not only high in nutrition but also help stave off the pangs of hunger. Um, to help ease kind of digestive problems that people who haven't eaten for a while. So there was ways of kind of imbuing this information within a tale, kind of saying, if you're ever in that situation, remember, this is how we were told about some of the stories. And even the baneful ones, there's a plant called um, Manlock, which is incredibly kind of specific skin. And we were told it was angel breath for children, because if you ever slept beneath it, the seeds are so toxic, it was to induce a kind of, um, kind of almost a comatose state. And the idea would be that you'd be swept away in the breath of angels. So that kind of way of telling stories was both to inform us about the qualities of story of the plants and the herbs, but also the dangers of them. And so it's a perfect way of saying that the idea right beneath that angels will sweep you away, to ingrain those kind of wisdoms within ourselves. Um, but I have to say the tale of tales and associations with bind read is something that's found a very warm place in my heart. And even now. When I, when I pass them, I'm very kind of going, just like, say, say good positive things, just in case. That's, that's absolutely beautiful. And actually, um, bindweed was one of my favourite flowers growing up. I always just thought it was so stunning. Like, I didn't understand why people didn't like it. But uh, I grew up calling it uh, tangleweed. Um, but uh, the, um, having uh, the... Um, the story you told about hemlock and angel's breath is probably the most evocative and beautiful warning to a child I've ever heard. And speaking of vulnerability, having a new book in the world, um, out in the world, is an exciting and vulnerable time. Um, the stories you've written here were always intended to be shared and handed down from person to person. But how do you as a writer envision them being read? Did you have an ideal writer in mind as you wrote the book, or did you write it for the child you were and the person that you are? Um, I, I, I think both. Um, the idea is that I, I, I benefit in such a deep way from hearing the stories of the child. They came, they came my compass, and they came my armor, and they came my sword, they came my, my extra pillow at, 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 at bedtime. So they came all of these things. So I benefited greatly from them. So I really wanted to retell my inner child and my absurd adulthood and self, but also to share with other people and their children and their own inner children. Because I do think that there's benefit in retelling our stories and reconnecting to our stories. The world 
without stories and, and the wonder of the natural world and our ancestors and people behind, her, behind us and their views and their opinions, their imaginations, it's such a hollow, pale comparison to the ones that we can co-create constantly with each other. And, um, and I just wanted the, the, it to just to find its own echo in the world. Um, and, I, and I do think it's something that I think you picked up on yourself, that I want them to be heard. I, I, they are written as the idea of going, it is an oral tradition and it's an ever changing tradition. But the idea would be if we, if we can say them, we can change them, we can grow them and it's per, everything is acceptable and everything's wonderful. Um, and then the, like, one of the most important things is the kind of going, it becomes part of your story, not just my story, the story. And that's what I think storytelling is really about. It's, it's really planting new seeds and just allowing ourselves to, to water them and nurture them, however way that we're called to, without these rules that we're told. Because I think these rules around writing is absolutely fascinating, of how people should write and how, how they should publish and how they should do this. And, and I think that, that takes us away from the idea of what we're trying to create. We all, at the end of the day, we all want to create something beautiful. You know, and it's not just about a product. It's about creating something that we're, we're sharing in, in communion with others. And, uh, and that's why I think they, they, they've, they've thankfully found um, this kind of crack in, in the wall and a warm place in many people's hearts so far. I do hope that it continue, continues. But they, they are, the stories are absolutely everything to us, but also they, they're allowed to be nothing as well. We're not bound by them. Um, but I think what the least we can do to ourselves is give ourselves the opportunity to find what they are. No, absolutely. And kind of it ties in a little to what you were saying about truth earlier, um, because they do, they have the ring of truth um, and that kind of makes you wonder um, and lighten them all the more. Um, speaking of delight, one of the beautiful things about this book is um, the phenomenal illustrations by artist um, Leanne McDonough. And I'm just wondering, what was the process of sourcing and working with her like? Oh, it was very easy. Um, I met Leanne probably seven, eight years ago. And the, well, at the end of our conversation, she said to me, for the love of God, will you just write a book? And I did, and I, now she might be sorry. But, um, <laughs> and, a, and a part of that whole process was that I, I wanted to, it to be like illustrated, and I wanted to be illustrated by by a, a travel artist. I also wanted her to have the freedom to illustrate it. So when she received the story, that like we we got to see them, I got to look at, got really excited by them. But her artwork is her her retelling of the stories in pictorial form. So it wasn't kind of going a giant it looked like this magpie in space with the head turned here. It was very much going to feel the stories and you retell them in the way that you tell them. And she's incredibly, very pleasant to work with, very easy going, going to work with, um, very, very professional, like all that kind of thing, but also excited by them as well, because she was reconnecting to some of her own stories and some stories that are behind her. And, uh, um, and different stories I had never thought about before. And, um, and so it, it really was an exciting process. It really was an exciting process. And it's not a process that I think that many writers today get to experience. Like many people aren't really going to get to experience sitting around a kitchen table, listening to a story, writing it, having an artist from your community going, I'll get this story, I'll, I'll see how it comes to me, I'll, I'll retell it my way, and, wor and working through that. So that it has been a wonderful collaboration, wonderfully exciting, but also it's really interesting on looking at stuff that she picked up on that I wouldn't have picked up on. Like she, she was drawn to certain images. I wouldn't have been drawn there, but that's the beauty of the retelling. Um, like she, that she was allowed to, and that like, and that the, that's the whole sense of it. Retell them, give give them your own life and the passion of it. And I have to say, it was, it was really enjoyable. It was really enjoyable. Um, and that kind of that shared memory and the kind of different, uh, the different responses that fit so seamlessly and beautifully together. Um, is is so interesting um the value of collective memory is something that is discussed in the book um the mink care they remember and these stories are part of your heritage but also a wider heritage um aside from the beauty and the tenderness of the writing this achievement is not just yours in the introduction you state that the stories were reviewed by your community um members before being included and in a sense though the voice is very much your own these stories have already taken up space in many hearts. Um, 
Um, what does it mean to you now mm. to share these stories with a wider audience? I, I, it's an opportunity for us to have the conversation that we always seem to be saying we're not having, but we're just having in a different way around our differences, around our similarities, around our shared origins. Um, and the, the, especially so wider middle of times that um, there seems to be a distance between us and there seems to be a gap between us and in fact that we're in our history is very symbiotic and it's connective and it's close and it's wonderful all the feedback because of all the other noise and actually speak to the kind of people in the community it was more about kind of the idea of it's how you remember the story and other people go no that's not the story at all it's different and even at one stage when we were looking for um someone to an audiobook was coming um like one of the people who had hoped would have to read it would be my own father and he comes with a really unusual uh, peculiarity that he cannot read the sentence of that story, <laughs> you know? And that, and I think that's the sign of a storyteller. Oh, no, no, it's different in my heart. You kind of go, that's fine. But this is the story for the moment. Um, and, and to make sure that the, especially those times I do name the living and I, and I, I do mention the dead, and to make sure that that was okay with it for people, that it was respectful. And one way or the other, there was no really getting away from the fact that I am from a minority group, that people don't really know much about, that nothing has really been published by us in this format, that it does come with responsibilities, that you want to do the best you want that you can do. And I was very tempted just to do it my own way. Um, but the one walks the path on their own. You know, we always have people with us. So listening to other people and their insights, um, I think benefited um, the work greatly. And I think there's something we learn from going together because we don't really own a story. We really just keep them up. Absolutely. And I think that's a wonderful, um, a wonderful way to open it up to um, questions from the audience. Um, so there's a question here from Joyce and she wants to know, Owen, does each story have a moral value? Um, I, I think... We need to look about how we, A, we understand morals um, and also how we interpret story. I think every story has a value that affects our morality and how we perceive them. I think the stories I was I, I had selected in the end with people are ones that came with a tone and a flow. But I still think that every story, like a story of somebody going to a shop and what they bought, brings with them understandings of what they, what they would spend their energy and money on and then purchasing, the journey to the place. So every story, depending on how we want to look at it, does have a sense of our own morality and our perceptions. But the story that I did select, I did want to, to get the ones and just connect the whispers of the ones that, the, that, was, that connected to something else if people wanted to listen to it. So I think those stories are far more exciting. But at the same time, all stories had those keys in them. It just depends how we actually wish to turn them. Um. No, absolutely. And actually, um, one of the things that you said uh, a little bit earlier um, kind of reminded me of, like, I always think when you put a work into the world that um, kind of, like, it becomes, it kind of stops being a conversation you're having with yourself and it starts being a conversation the reader is having with it. And it seems like this book stemmed from so many different conversations um, and I'm just kind of um, wondering on the on the journey to um, this actually this is kind of another question from a woman called Vivian um, knowing at some of the discrimination that the traveler community faces um, was it was it a difficult road to getting published um, I'm quite lucky is that the first publishers I formally approached was the Sky and Press. Um, and I think publishing has to be a partnership for me. I would say if I kind of contacted most mainstream publishers with the expectation I had is that things are going, I wanted to have a certain amount of a promise towards the, the tone of the book, uh, how it would be presented, things like um, the conversations of, like, are they going to be published? I wanted to have a sense of, you're not going to get this physically produced as an item in a space that has using anti-traveler rhetoric. So there's you no, know, and like, and I don't think most people would have had those conversations or nuanced around them. And you know, and I and to have the idea of being a relatively very unknown writer, for kind of saying, well, you know, like rather than you taking a book, I really want to share this experience with you. 
and I'm, I'm trusting that you will honor it as much as possible, but also know that it comes with complications with me and that those complications can be sounded out and found in a home in. And I don't think that most publishers envision being open to that probably wouldn't have been to the same degree because of their own deadlines or complexities and also the distance from the community at times. And because again, I don't know many people from the public background that would, would a, you'd end up in their houses and they'd be in your home on the kitchen table kind of going, common, it's, it's, it's common to me, I swear, you know, and then just letting it run. And that kind of, that process and making sure that it was so, so honoured by the oral storytelling tradition um, is one I think that most publishers wouldn't really be able to connect script writing on screens. And even the idea of, I have a busy life, of uh, like two roles and a family and people coping well with 2 p.m. kind of edits, you know, that takes dedication. Yeah. That takes dedication to, to listen to an email yeah. to myself in that hour of the morning. Um, and, I, and, I, I, and, I, and I'm glad I didn't experience it, but at the same time, I did put the effort into auditioning my publishers. And I'm glad I got the opportunity rather than just taking a publisher that was my stuff on and making sure that it was as much as possible a real, um, rather than a, um, an ex I suppose, an exchange. You know? And, and I, I think for many people, they might find difficult in that, especially they're writing from a place of sensitivity, of concern, of responsibilities that we know and accept aren't ours. Like the 40,000 travelers, my God, like how can I carry them on my shoulders? But the world implies, and the world implies you are connected, that you are responsible, and one way or the other, you are a reflection of, of this entire diverse community. So, and so to navigate those spaces can be difficult. So I was absolutely blessed. I was absolutely blessed. And, um, and, and it was something that I'd hope that other people um, can find themselves in themselves, because I think I've absolutely found myself my uh, 40 clover in finding um, Grania and Fanula. Um, as it says in the book, if like, if, if patients get to a place in heaven, they have fine beds. Oh, they are, there are some women, they're fantastic. Um, I was kind of stuck there, I was thinking about um, kind of how, like, with the lack of traveller kind of folklore and literature being presented in, in the world for consumption, like outside of the traveller community, that like it will be easy for kind of like me to assume that you would feel that your voice wasn't valued but actually because of the preciousness and the importance of story um within the community that they were kind of like that value was there and that belief that they were kind of extremely important and extremely worth sharing um must have kind of been a driving force. Um, we have a question from Damien and he's asking what um, what your hopes are for this book from your own community and also from others? Um, well, first off is that what coincided with the writing of this is that I was working with uh, Senator um, Claire Kelher uh, within her office and we were championing a bill called the Education Bill, you know, the, uh, Trevor uh, culture and, and, and history and education, which has now been absolutely taken up um, by Senator Eileen Flynn, who's incredibly passionate about it and really going to drive it. Um, part of that kind of whole exploration was that we worked with the NCCA about our curriculum. And within the junior and, sing and senior cycle, there was no evidence of travelers within the, within the education structure. Now, we did do people and we did reviews, and there were teachers who were gathering that information quite well, but there was nothing within the actual curriculum. And that's, mm -hmm. that space primarily troubles me for travellers because I think we're all very used to a certain degree of the discrimination we have to carry with us, the barriers that are in place. But for travellers, especially in the situation where people can be more distanced from their, from their families and the wider kin and the barriers in place, to not know their own stories, to not see mm -hmm. themselves in the stories, to not see ourselves be our own champions, um, our own retellings. For instance, like many of the elder, like elder kind of myths, especially the Ulster cycles, like, People like O'Cullen, he was a traveller to us. You know, and you look at the stories, like, oh, he travelled, he did this, kind of, they were all part of us, you know? And, and then when you read the other narratives, especially within the kind of the, these other structures, you're kind of going, you don't really see us. And my first panic was kind of going, if we're not there, we can so easily forget ourselves. 
and forget the importance yeah. of ourselves and forget that we are custodians of this yeah. ancient lineage. And I think well, I was really hopeful that this story is just another spark that will hopefully light fires up in people's own hearts for their own stories. And they've been like carrying them and holding them and embracing them have been an incredible point of resilience to myself. But also to share with part of the community the idea that we are not people of issue and problem um, is very important to me. That we may, may not have had the opportunity to see us or to hear us or to spend time with us, but like our community is just as diverse and odd and wonderful and funny and terrifying as every other one. So can we meet each other in that kind of common kind of humanity field and meet each other as the ways we should always meet each other rather through these limiting ideas that we have been hoisted upon us by a structure that doesn't know us, um, a system that can at times be suspicious of us and that we're at times of physical distance from each other, that here is just another bridge in that wild torrent storm of a sea to say, let's chat. That's beautiful. Um, there's a question from Martin, um, and he wants to know what advice would you give to um, young men cares and other young people who want to be a poet or a writer? So write, literally, if you have a pen and you can use it, write it. If you record it, record it. And um, nothing is without value. And I, I think honestly, after the kind of going. Like I think I think ninety percent of that mountain you climb, which I envisioned at the time, if anyone has climbed it, I've done it twelve times, uh, is the reek, no crow Patrick. Yes, the the first little kind of slump that you have all this energy and then you're slumped down again. Then you have the big climb at the very top you have all those weekly stones, which is the editing, right? Which is which is I think we all find unusual. Um but for the whole thing is like just let it flow, just write it, have to read it. No one has to look at it, no one has to judge it, it's just yours. You know, create something. If you find it beautiful, share it. If you don't, think about where you can, what you can do with it. But the main thing is just, just, just make it happen. And I, I, how I made mine happen was in the moments of like the stolen hours between kind of uh, between jobs or early in the morning or on the bus when we were could get in the evening on the way home. And and just when you can and you're inspired to do it. And and, and most of all, like don't be horrendous judge to yourself. What you're really doing is you're taking part of your own heart and how they fit together. And that can take time. It can take patience. Most of all, it takes kindness to ourselves. It's a, like, the worst thing that we can ever do is not give ourselves the opportunity. If you believe yourself to be a poet, you are a poet. If you believe yourself to be a writer, you are a writer. It doesn't need the external reference of the world to find you as you are. Um, and the most thing is that if you're called to produce and create and share and celebrate something, just do it. So these rules aren't rules at all they're just expectations we put on ourselves and the world is put on us and we can most certainly overcome them by saying i'm doing it my very own way um that is brilliant and we have i think we have a really really good last question because it is from leanne um and she wants to know owen when are you writing your next book <laughs> well, Leanne, yeah, as you as you ask, um, I know I've started I've started that process. Um, at the moment, it's it's tangibly called uh, the Tree Woman, which is one of the I suppose creatures from our own folklore around ghost stories. And um, just like the first one, I'm going to allow it to 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 create itself, and allow myself the freedom to create my own stories with my own imagination. But I'm sure I'll I'll be quite inspired by the tales and stories that have come with me. But that process has started, and um, so I think like many things that once they are in motion, we get kept away with them. Um, and I'm, and so far, I most certainly have enjoyed the journey. Um, yeah, and and readers will too. They love the journey that you take them on, Owen. Um, thank you so much for your insightful you. and compelling oh, thank answers you, tonight. It was such a delight to talk to you. You too, and I very much appreciate it, and everyone who's attended. Congratulations and to all of you at home who joined us. Um, Why the Moon Travels is available in your local bookshop for those of you in Ireland, and it's also available on the Scheme Press website for those of you who can't get into an Irish bookshop for whatever reason. Um.
And I want to thank everyone for um, joining us today. It was lovely to hear from Owen. And thank you, Deirdre, for your insightful questions, really pulling out from Owen all the beauty in the writing that he's done and, and his reason for doing it. And I also want to thank Grania and Fanula at Skeen Press. And please do go and buy Why the Moon Travels by Owen Divardoon with illustrations by Leanne McDonough. Um, you can visit Skeen Press online and please also visit irishartcenter.org to find out more about our programming. Thank you. <laughs>